Uh, so after Odium. Um, I went to Marham. 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 Uh, where uh, is that? That's in East Anglia, near Kings Lynn. Okay, okay. Uh, flying out of Marham were Tornadoes, 27 Squadron and 617. Ooh, okay. And Victor Tankers. What's that? Victor Tankers. It used to be the V Bomber. Ah, okay. We had three V Bombers at one time the Valiant, the Victor, and the Vulcan. Okay. All okay. Right? The Valiant was a bad news game. Um, so they sort of ditched that quite quickly. Uh, we kept the Vulcan and the Victor, but the Victor, because of because of the modernisation that it could do, was uh, lumped with lots and lots of fuel tanks in it, in its bomb bay. Right. And it became a tanker refuel a tanker. Oh, okay. So basically, it sort of takes off, legs it off to wherever tornadoes or whatever plugs into it, takes on fuel. And they're up there for another hour. Ah. Got it, got it, got it. So was you working on all of those aircraft? No, I was in um, end jobs, which is basically sort of making sure that the squadrons, when they wanted something, they got it. Okay, okay. Because um, now you're a chief. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically. But, I mean, there was a sergeant with us. It's just that, that the post is open. It's a senior NCO's post, which is basically sergeant or chief tech. Um, and, yeah, that's where they put me. Okay. How long was you there for? In end jobs? Yeah. <laughs> did the whole time, I think. Yes, I did. 82 to 84. Okay, yeah. So about two years. A lot of fun. Yeah. Um, 27 Squadron had a thing called a dinger chart. Your uh, chart? A dinger chart, yeah, dinger chart. <laughs> uh, basically because um, <sighs> new aircraft, for some unknown reason, are left and right. I'm old school. I talk port and starboard. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Red, left, port, green, starboard. Okay. Right. Four letters in port, four letters in left. Port is a red wine. The red light goes on the right hand, left hand side. Bubba. <laughs> so, first time it happened, it happened on 617 Squadron. Can we have a, a 1K uplift? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So I go onto the Bowsers and I say, two one seven, uh, six one seven, want a one a one k uplift. And the guy said, six one seven does. And I went, yeah. He said, are you sure? And I said, that's what I said. And he said, yeah. Victor Tankers, if you're talking about one k, it's one thousand pounds of fuel. Right. Tornadoes. When they talk about 1K, it's one kilogram. There's a bloody lot of difference. Yeah. <laughs> so into, two, uh, into 617 goes this double tanker from the MT yard. And they go, where are you going? Well, you want a 1K uplift. 27 got onto it very quickly and decided, okay, we'll have a digger chart. When we mean 1K, we will talk about kilograms. When we talk about left and right, we will talk port and starboard because Digger doesn't understand left and right. Because <laughs> the first time it happened, they turned around and said, can we have a left-hand engine? And I went, is that looking from the front or looking from the back? Right. <laughs> Sorry, there's only one way to look. No. It depends whether you're standing at the nose looking backwards or whether you're standing at the arse end looking forward. And they said, no, it's where the pilot sits. And I said, I'm not a pilot. <laughs> I'm a rigger. You know, fairly standard. What do you want, port or starboard? He said, I don't know. Well, what colour is the light on the side of the engine you want? He said, red. Fine, you want a port engine. Thank you very much. Easy, isn't it? <laughs> so they made a digger charter. <laughs> do you think it's stuck for a while? <laughs> <laughs> it's silly. It's silly. But, but it's American. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Uh, Sounded like it was good fun. It was. It was. Yeah, yeah. There was an uh, an item. I wasn't involved, but um, there was always a, an officer on um, because we from from the Victor tankers used to do a thing called Tansaw. Don't ask me what it stands for. It really doesn't matter. But it's when a Russian comes around the top of Norway, mm. and we then scramble aircraft from Lossiemouth. No, Lucas. We scramble aircraft from Lucas. They go up and they escort him. Uh, but by the time they've scrambled on full reheat, 
and got up there, they need some more juice. So Tansa is also scrambled. It legs it up to the north of Scotland. They plug in and they're up there for another hour and then Victor just stooges round until the Russian goes away <coughs> and that's it. No problem. So um, this guy gets a phone call um, and after about, I don't know, four or five minutes, he just slammed the phone down. And I said, what's wrong? He said, just, I can't remember the name of the village, but just the other side of the uh, road that runs down the Perry track of the airfield, uh, there's a village. He said, and there's a wing commander flying who's just moved into a house over there and he's complaining about the noise <laughs> from the airfield. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I can't remember the name of the flight attendant either, but it doesn't matter. Um, he was told to apologise to this wing commander, who was then a, an honorary member of the mess, um, by the group captain, and um, he refused. He said, no. No, I am not apologising to a man who has moved next to an airfield and then complains about the bloody noise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> um, but, yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. So when they send up these aircraft to escort uh, these other countries... Yeah, yeah. What happens if they don't go away? Oh, they do. They do? They do. I mean, we've got the refuelling... The Victor is just staying up there. Okay. He just floats round and round and round. So our guys might be up there for a couple of hours, maybe three hours. But in the end, the Russian loses fuel. And He's has to got go back. to go back home. Right. Yeah. And yeah, invariably, they don't do it like that. I mean, all he does is sort of head towards our international border and then just miles he turns off. Mm. Well, by which time we've scrambled and gone up there and they wave at each other. They know each other. The only thing different is, and they probably do contact each other by radio, the only thing different is the fact that they know each other's names. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's quite laughable, really. Yeah. They're testing our um, reaction time and they think it's fun. Because it's in the news very often these days, isn't it? Mm. Um, oh, they've been doing it for years. Yeah. What, what, why, do you, why? Why do you think they're testing the reaction time? What, 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 what's your well, view on uh, There's no reason, really, just to be a bit of a pain in the ass. Yeah. And that's all it is, really. Yeah. I've always wondered why. Like, are they, are they testing us? What happens if we don't scramble? Like, I don't know. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> possibly. But, I mean, we always do. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, the game goes on. Yeah. <laughs> How do the pilots find that like I'm well that, so most of them find it quite amusing because mm. it, it's fun something to do yeah <laughs> that's right um i mean suddenly being sort of hauled out of bed at three o'clock in the morning because the russian bears come around the north of norway uh, jumping into your aircraft pressing the tip you're halfway down the um perry track towards the runway by the time you've got your belts done up and all the rest of it um and then you take off i mean yeah. it's good fun yeah do you technicians have to be on call as well yeah. for things like that because yes. I'm guessing whilst they're getting their kit on you've got to do the pre-flight checks that's right or not that, pre-flight well, you, checks but the pre no I mean that's all done it, it's all ready to go it's ready to yes go. technicians have to be on standby purely and simply because if it doesn't start got to get it going. you've got to get it going and yeah. if, I mean there's normally uh, say uh, two aircraft go scrambling at any one time and there's normally either three or four aircraft ready ready to rock and roll yeah, yeah. so that if yeah. one doesn't start they can actually sort of leap out of that one, get into the next one, and have a go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so where do you where do you head head off to next? So um, uh, for main jobs, uh, I went to Swanton Morley. Swanton Morley. Oh. Where is that? Um, near Deerham, in East Anglia. Still in East Anglia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you're still a chief. Yeah. Oh yeah. What, sat, what's the role at this location? I was put into a, a an office. Um, called Maritime Transport and Training Helicopters. So we dealt with all the maritime aircraft, all the transport aircraft, all the training aircraft and the helicopters. Um, quite fun. Um, I learned even more about log cards there. But it, it was quite fun. I hated it, but it was quite fun. I did an awful lot of learning about the... going back about the shaft of the arrow... Okay, yes. Yeah. You know, uh, I learned an awful lot there. Um, so was you doing the training 
No, 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 no. no. no you, there's no you're training. Overseeing... It's a, it, you're looking after training aircraft. Oh, 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 right. Okay, so the train, the yeah. aircraft that are used to train pilots. Pilots. Yeah, that's what you're doing. That's right. Right, right, right. And basically, it's it's modifications. It's um, I'll give you two instances. One yeah. was on a Phantom. Um, the other one was on Nimrods. Um, the air conditioning system on a ha- on a Phantom was going quite frequently pear shaped, um, and they wanted to know why. So they gave me the task, and I went to the people who made them or serviced the air conditioning units. There's two on a Phantom. There's one for all the avionics, and there's one for the pilot and the co-pilot. Um, and basically what I found out in my talking to technicians and all the rest of it was the fact that um, if the air conditioning unit fails before 200 hours, then change it. If it goes beyond 200 hours, don't change it. Leave it alone. But it only had, a, in theory, at this time, only had a 200-hour life. Okay. Then you take it out. Then it goes to be serviced. Then it comes back, sits on a shelf for a while before it's needed, maybe another one pear-shaped or time time expired. So then you put it back in. Now, there's no guarantee that the one that went to 200 hours is going to go to 200 hours this time. It might only last 20. But what I found out from um, this investigation was basically if you allow it to go over 200 hours, it will go on forever. Providing okay. you keep it oiled, yeah, you know, yeah. keep the bearings going, providing you keep it oiled, it will virtually go on forever. You don't need to change it. I came back and I recommend I had to write out the report and I came back and I wrote out the report and I was um, talked to by the uh, wing commander, who was a cracking guy, Lang, his name was, wing commander Lang, and he talked to me and he said, are you serious? And I went, well, that's that's what all the um, investigation has shown. Um, it's what's been proven. And he said, oh, right, let's see if we can get this through. Um, the Air Force Board ignored it, turned around and said, nope, 200 hour life, that's what it's going to stay at. And I just sort of summed up then and said, okay, fine, it's cost me this, it cost me that, it cost me that. So you've spent £18,000 for me to go on this investigation and you're just throwing my um, findings out of the window. Yep. <laughs> and I thought, what am I doing here? You know, just what is the point? So, you know, that was that was the major problem. The Nimrod was the same, basically. It was a question of it was leaking like a sieve. It still does leak like a sieve. They go up there uh, to, I can't remember now, Kinloss. They go up to Kinloss. They do a ma- That's where they're based. And they do a major servicing at Kinloss. Um, they've only been given a certain number of hour, uh, days or weeks or whatever to do this, this servicing. And when it comes out, it leaks. So the line team then have to do all the sort of rectification they can to stop this thing leaking. Again, I find out that um, if you allow an extra two days on the end of the servicing and allow the riggers to get into the fuel tanks and to seal the fuel tanks properly, then you haven't got all this problem out on the first line. Another one. I flew up there from Norwich. I spent... uh, Three days up there, wined and dined by the mess, so all on taxpayers' money. Love it. <laughs> um, uh, I came back, but flew back. Again, something in the reason of £27,000 spent on a, a, a report that was negated. We can't allow two extra days. Yes, you can, if it means two days not being done out on the first line. Yeah. So um, I'm guessing you got to a mindset of you're doing all this work, you're doing all this investigation, you're coming up with a report... There and it's negated, it, and then they're like, "No, don't agree." That's right. So what's the <laughs> well, exactly? What's the point? Yeah, that's, yeah. Ex- that's exactly my. I understand argument. why you shuddered when you spoke about. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, yeah, there's yeah. an awful good, a, a lot of good done in Swanton Morley. I mean, special tools. Um, there's there's a tool cell at Swanton Morley that actually, if you ring in and sort of say, "This is what I need," they will move heaven and earth to get you a tool that will fit what it is you need it for. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's there's an awful lot of good stuff. Yeah. An awful lot of good yeah. stuff. It was just that, you know, the, the, the place I was put, 
I mean, something they were t- moving over to computers at that time. Okay. I'd never even touched a computer. <laughs> um, and I was writing my reports out uh, by hand and then handing it to a little dolly typist who was doing all the, you know, the typing and, and getting it up into a proper report. And they said, we're moving to computers. And I carried on writing mine out. I didn't want to know. Yeah. Um, and in the end, the squad leader turned around at me and he said, you will use the computer. Okay, fine. So I sat down in front of this damn computer and for about one finger typing. I still do <laughs> one finger typing, but I'm a bit quicker now. Um, I sat down in front of this computer, I suppose, for about two weeks. And each night, when you close it down, I remembered to save. It's not like today's computers where it says, do you want to save this? Mm -hmm. If you turn it off, you've turned it off. (laughs) So after two weeks, I turned it off, forgetting to save. Two weeks work, eight till five, wiped off. Oh, no. (laughs) So I went back to writing. The squad leader said, I thought you were – and I just blew up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just, I just lost it, and I said, "No, tell you what, sir, I'll dictate you type, and when you close it down, you remember to, to save it because that's what I did. I forgot." And uh, I suppose in that role as well, that's quite important because you're doing a lot of information. There's a lot well, of that's information right. that you're that's right. Down. You're writing a report. Yeah. I mean, you, you're yeah. writing a, um, the introduction, which is basically why and what you're going to investigate. You're then writing every single stage, which invariably comes up to about sort of six or seven pages. You're writing so six or seven pages showing where you've investigated, who you've talked to and where you've been and, and all the rest of it. And in the end, you write this conclusion. So, yeah, it's it's three, maybe four weeks' work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I just lost half of it. Yeah. And I went, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I, I never used the computer again. Okay. Um, there. Um, and from there, I went back to Chibna. Okay, yeah, back to Chibna. Yeah. Um, what year is this now? Uh, back to Chibna, I went back in 88. In 88, okay. So... They were on Hawks then. So this is 25... Am I doing the maths right? 25 years that you've been in? Um, 25 years. Yeah. 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 So you're a chief technician, 25 years, going to Chibna on Hawks. Yeah. So... New aircraft. Another new aircraft. Uh, it's like a is it a smaller, smaller? Yeah, plane? Well, very much smaller. Yeah, yeah but um, basically ran the same sort of role, but it was a bit quicker. Yeah, bit same nippier. role as as the hunters. Sorry, as the hunters. It, it's okay. a single. Well, no, it's not. It's a dual seat, um, but it, it's used for training. Okay. Yeah. Um, at Chibna, two, uh, it used to be two two nine OCU, but it's it wasn't then. Uh, they split us up into squadrons. I think I was on sixty three. Um, are these, I, I might be wrong here. Uh, red arrows are they? The red arrows are hawks. They're hawks as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. So people know and think of a red arrow. That is the. That's the right. It's, ours were just camouflage. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. Um, couple of things happened there. Um, I was given a guy from Cranwell, who was learning to be an engineering officer, and we had an aircraft in the corner. That literally. We were sending, we were working on it. We'd send it up. It would fly perhaps two or three sources, and then one leg would drop. Not right. by much, but enough to make a micro switch show he's got a red light in the in the cockpit. Okay, yeah, we don't drop about half an inch, and then no more. And we were systematically working through every single valve, changing this valve, then sending it back up. It would last. It may not last. It may it may happen on that sortie or it may last two sorties, and it comes down with no left hand leg dropped again. So I'll go, okay, fine, bring it back into the hangar, change the next valve down the line or the next, you know, whatever. And this little engineering officer came in, pilot officer, and he said, why don't you change all the valves in one go? <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, because then we don't learn, do we? Mm. Because if this happens to another aircraft, it costs an awful lot of time and money to change every single valve yeah. because you don't know which one has actually affected the one, the problem. Yeah, yeah. So that night um, we went back into my office upstairs, port cabins, and um, the squad leader says, right, 
how many you got for tomorrow morning? So I told him how many we got for tomorrow morning. And he says, is, and I can't remember the number of it, but it is uh, one, two, three going out. And I said, yeah, we've got it out. And I said, it'll go again. And this little guy pipes up and says, I suggest that they change all the valves. And I turn around this little pipe officer and I said, you shut your face. You are not an engineering officer yet. I'm a chief. I've done work on these things. You haven't. Go away. Mind your own business. And the squad leader looked at me and he looked at this little guy and he said, can you excuse us a couple of minutes? And this little guy sort of wanders off and he says, don't ever do that to me again. You might be in the right, but don't ever do that in front of me again. He's an officer. And I said, all right, I apologise, sir, but there is no way I am having a pilot officer who is training to be an engineering officer coming in here and telling me my job. Mm. He said, no, I appreciate that. And when I get him in the bar later, I will tell him just that. <laughs> but don't ever do that in front of me again. So as a, as a chief technician, do you get hands on yourself? I did, quite yeah, a bit? very yeah. much so. Uh, yeah. Whenever I could. I mean, obviously, there's still an awful lot of paperwork to do. Yeah, because you've got a team that you're running. That's and, right. And, 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 and there's things like um, over-signatures and independence that you've got to do. Independence are things on aircraft that are exceptionally necessary, like um, controls. Yeah, I mean, uh, you change an aileron, you need to know that that aileron is going to stay on. So you've got um, the guy who's doing the work, you've got an over-signature, of the guy who's helping him do the work, and it's normally a call. Um, and then you've got an independent, which is where the chief or the sergeant comes in. And because he's had nothing to do with that job, he inspects it from start to finish. Yeah, all the split pins are in, all the wire locking's done, everything's done up as it should do. Yeah, range of movement's good. Fine, I'll, t I'll sign the independence. So, yeah, I did get okay. um, a, a, an amount of time That's on. good. That's good that you still got hands on. And, and I think that maybe bode well with your team, right? Because then they know that you know what you're on about because you've got hands on exactly i mean so. it was a new aircraft so therefore i was also turning around to um sacs and jts and saying what are we doing about so and so cool so they're, they're teaching me yeah, so yeah. i am picking up knowledge i mean it's what i said to you earlier you know that um i defer to experience at any time yeah 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 that's cool that's cool i, I think good leadership like that is what makes a good team so yeah it sounds like well it worked good. i mean three teams i built um no, that's unfair. Three teams. Three teams I was put in charge of, and they excelled. Now, yes, that's partly leadership, but it's also because they they sort of accepted and trusted what I was saying. Mm. I mean, nobody ever buggered around with my team. Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, if if you if you were scruffily dressed under chief tech or an officer picked you up, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's something that sort of had to do with an aircraft, then no, they come back to me and you talk to me. Yeah. You do not talk to my guy. If I think he's worthy of a bollocking, I will give it. I will kick his ass. <laughs> but you don't. That is fair. That is fair. At this point, are you looking at promotion? Or no, no, no. But just prior to me coming out, well, I say just prior, about a year before I came out, I was at Lynham. I was offered my flight sergeant. Um, and that's going f so the chief, chief technician is that, is that the highest as a like no no I can still go to warrant officer oh you could all yeah. right okay but not without time served so okay. I really need to be sort of flight son at the age of sort of 40 45 excuse me 40 45 and then perhaps I'd have got a warrant officer one of my guys did okay he, okay. he went all the way to warrant officer, warrant officer. so what's, what's above chief technician flight son it's flight sergeant right right yeah. it's flight sergeant yeah, I suppose, yeah. And then and then after that is warrant, warrant officer. officer. Okay, okay. The okay. thing about our flights on, on our sort of places is the fact that it's a desk job. Uh, is it? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> all the flight sergeants I've seen um, are in an office doing key orderlies, um, T-bar ro rosters. Um, in the case of the guy who was there, um, it was a question of, Right, can you get me the file on so and so and so and so? So he becomes basically an yeah, office boy, and I thought, yeah. no, that isn't for me. I like being out in the rough and tumble and the the swearing and the the general shit that goes on on a hangar floor. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, and then there is a little bit of office based stuff because you've got oh, to do some quick work, so you got the best of both. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I, you've still got to do assessments. Yeah, you've, you've still got to make certain that spares are coming in at the right time. So it's a question of 
why haven't we got it? I mean, there was a time, you know, when uh, we were changing the fin on a Hercules. Um, and we ordered the fin and this hooky great box comes in. I mean, if you imagine the box is about the length of this garden, it's a fin for yeah, a Hercules, okay. big thing. That's the thing. So I get my guys to um, undo the box and I, I go back into the office and all of a sudden uh, Cy Auckland, who was one of my sergeants, turned around and he said, um, are you comfortably seated? And I went, why? He said, I've got a bit of a tail. And I said, good or bad? He said, you're not going to like it. He said, that box is empty. I said, you mean it's come down all the way from Stafford and it's been empty? He said, yeah, I blew up. <laughs> I went absolutely bloody daft. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I was berated for that too because <laughs> I was at the other end. I said, I want the man who got that box on the bloody wagon charged. I will come up there and I will make certain that I am the charging officer. Um, but basically nothing happened. We got another <laughs> fin within two days, but, you know, it was an empty box for God's sake. Was it like a wooden crate type yeah. box? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So did you work, you worked on Hercules a lot? I did the last five years on Hercules. And where, where's this at? That was at Lynham. That was at Lynham. So did you go from... Hawks. Uh, at Chivenham? Chivenham was closing down. They were going to oh, give it to it? the Royal Marines. Really? Which they did. Okay. Um, and they buggered it up, quite honestly. You can't ever use it as an airfield again. And yet it was one of the best airfields that I've ever served on. Um, we were getting, during the summer, on a fairly regular basis, 200 sorties a day. 120 sorties a day, big one. So Which is sorties. Aircraft takes off, comes down, that's a sortie. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, you're doing 200 up to No, 200. 120. 120, right. Each aircraft does, um, if you, if it's a good day, each aircraft goes up and does um, four sorties. Wow. And that's starting off at about sort of 8 o'clock in the morning when the pilots date to come in. Um, and you can, it, on a good day, you can get sort mm. of four sorties out of every aircraft. Okay, okay. Yeah, bloody so the, hard work. But so, so that you know, so that location was good for that. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Then they moved it. I mean, it was good for hunters too. And for the same reason, the weather was always good. Um, then they closed. That was a political decision because Labour wanted to win the election, so they decided to move two two nine OCU up to Broady. Okay. Yeah. Purely political. It was got nothing to do with anything other than Labour wanted the, the Labour seat in the area of Wales. Um, but we lost sorties. I mean, 100 mile an hour fogs. Well, really? Yeah, in <laughs> Broadie. We went into work one morning. Had to, uh, you start work at half six because there's a, it's just one continuous line. I said there was a lot of pressure at Broadie and I loved it. Um, this is the second time you were there or the first time you were there? No, I was only Broadie once. Oh, you were Broadie once, right. Um, but it was, um, we went in at half six and I picked up the phone. I was on um, the desk at the time. I picked up the phone and, and talked to the engineering um, senior NCO in NJOPS. And I said, we're not pulling them out. Uh, I can't remember his name. I was with him at Chibner too. And he said, why not? And I said, have you looked at the weather out there? I said, we are not flying today. You know, just no way. And he said, oh, come on. He said, it's only a little breeze. And I went... Have a look outside. And the next thing I heard was a crash, <laughs> an absolute crash. Old metal windows uh, on a hinge. Yeah. He opened the window. It got taken out of his hand, smashed against the wall, all six windows out. <laughs> he came back. He said, you bastard. And I said, I did tell you. <laughs> he said, you can't see more than five feet. I said, I know that. It's a 100-mile-an-hour fog out there. We are not pulling. And he went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you head up to Lynham, is that right? Yeah, no. Uh, from After. from Chivna on Hawks, yes. Then I went to Lynham. Then you went to Lynham. Um, to more aircraft you'd not worked on before. Yep, Hercules. So big things. Yeah, yeah, big things that probably most people in the military have been on. Once oh yeah, or twice. yeah. I mean, I, I flew up to sing, uh, up to Hong Kong in one. Uh, when was you in Hong Kong? Only for it was a, it was a Battle of Britain display out of oh, Singapore. Yeah, okay, and uh, we sent uh, three hunters. Uh, Yes. No, four hunters, um, just to make sure we had one that flew. Um, 
from Tenga, we went to Clarkfield, which is in the Philippines. And then from there, we went to, I can't remember the second stage, but uh, this is purely simply because the hunter can only stay up for 40 minutes. Right. To an hour. Um, so it had to stage its way up. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, a lot that's of fun. Good. That's good. Yeah. Um, so what did you think of Lyndon then when you got there? Lyndon was, it's, it's quite a, a, a well-run camp. Okay. Or was. It, it, that's closed down now. It's become a technical school, I believe, for all three services. Um, yeah, I, I was put on to Red Team in ASF, Aircraft Servicing Flight. Um, and Ray and I got on very well. Um, he was in charge. I was supposed to be the chief on the floor, but I didn't know anything about bloody Hercules. So I was like a tits on a ball basically <laughs> I was just you know I was out of my depth totally so I was sort of walking around and sort of saying to guys what you're doing why and sort of picking up some information that way um and then the warrant officer who I got on with particularly well Jim he turned around he said do you fancy a team and I said oh yeah so he said right green team's yours and he gave me a bit of a warning he said um they do weekends at the moment and some overtime. And I went, oh, not on me, they don't. I ain't no overtime. And he said, well, it's up to you. So I walked in. My inevitable way, and it always has worked, is that I go in with a fist of iron. Uh, they all came into the crew room on the first morning, or that, you know, the, the where, where all the paperwork's done. And I said, my name's Chief Depp Bell. That's what you would call me until I tell you otherwise. I said, what you call me behind my back, I don't give two hits. But it's Chief Bell to my face. You will come in here and you will start work at 8 o'clock. You will knock off at 12. You will come back at 1 and you will knock off at 5. Anybody who is late needs a bloody good excuse. I will hammer you. You want a cup of coffee to take onto the floor? You come in at quarter to 8 or quarter to 1. And then I just walked out. Cy Auckland came behind me and he said... It's a bit harsh, do you think? I went, no, sorry, I don't think it is. Um, it worked. Um, within about a month, maybe two, they were all calling me Digger. Um, there was no sort of animosity. Um, we were getting the aircraft back out on time again, uh, again because of the work they did, not because I um, was kicking ass or anything. Um, they knew I was going to prepare to blow up if I needed to. Um, because I said I, I go in with a fist of iron, basically, um, and then allow it to relax. Mm. Mm. Um, a couple of upsets, um, minor things, really. Uh, warrant officer caught me hanging out of a fully extended giraffe, changing light bulbs in the ceiling. Um, he didn't shout at me, but when I came down, he nearly blasted my ears out. <laughs> Don't ever let me see you do that again. He and I got on particularly well. Um, I split my head open, got seven stitches in it by running up the back end of a herc. And, uh, the the doors on a herc, uh, the back one goes up there and the bottom one goes that way. So that you, it gives you a loading ramp. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was running up the loading ramp and this one wasn't fully up. Ah. I just I just took the, sorry, I took the head out. Oh. And seven stitches. Bloody hell. The hardest part was getting the shaved round it. That hurt. <laughs> that really hurt. But it was just a pink mist that came down and, and the guy who was sort of standing in there said, what have you done? I said, nothing. And then all of a sudden this pink mist came over and I went, oh, no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so your time there, um, how long was that for? Five years. That was five years? Yeah. Um, did you go away anywhere or was you just stationed there? No. Nope. So the whole time there? Yeah. Um, I'm guessing more stories from that time. Like, there's an awful lot of stories I've missed. Basically, yeah. yeah. Is um, there is there one more you can from that five years working on on the Hercs and well, yeah. um, the test crew that flew the Hercs after the the servicings because you have to go up and test everything in flight. Um, the test crew uh, was um, I can't remember why, but they'd lost their engineer and they'd lost their navigator. The navigator is not a problem because they know the test route uh, off by heart. Um, but 
the engineer, they hadn't got one. And it was on, um, I decided to go for a swan song before I left. Um, having hurt, having worked, uh, beg pardon, having gone up to Singapore, beg pardon, on Hong Kong in a Herc, um, I wasn't up on the flying platform. Mm. Whereas going up on a swan song, you can stand behind the pilot and the co-pilot and you, on takeoff and landing and you're as safe as houses because your body is up against the back of his seat and th there ain't nothing going to happen. And um, <laughs> I was standing behind this engineer and this engineer's reading out the numbers and the navigator is taking the numbers down. And he, he just happened to mention, um, yeah, all, all, all four oil pressures are correct. And I looked and I thought, no, I don't know. Would you like to borrow my glasses? <laughs> and he looked up at me and I mean, if looks could kill, it, it would have. And he said, what do you mean? I said, the number two, the oil is down. And the pilot looked at the gauge and he said, I don't think you're going to fly with me again. We need somebody we can trust. And I thought, oh, my God, I've just got this bloke in this shit. But, you know, basically, uh, yeah, quite fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got taken down the back end, got a monkey harness, put, monkey harness put on, back end was dropped and I'm sitting on the side with my legs dangling in, into nothing about 5,000 feet. Ooh. It's <laughs> good fun, <laughs> provided you know you're safe, and you're, you're attached and to the you're attached. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. So, did you did you fly? Did you do exercises with the Hercules? Um, no, or, or not not really with them. No, no, no. no. The pure, purely a servicing flight. They servicing come in, flight. you turn them around, you go back out again. Yeah. But the team really worked for me. I mean, you know, yeah. um, there was a special ops aircraft that came in, and the squadron leader said. It's the only one that is anywhere near serviceable. Can you get it done by? And I said, you do realise that's two days off the servicing? And he said, yeah, I do. He said, can you do it? I said, I don't know. I'll let you know tomorrow. Um, so at five o'clock, I turned around to these guys and I said, this aircraft has to go out on uh, Wednesday night. And they said, well, Wednesday, it doesn't matter what day, but I say Wednesday. And they said, you're joking. I said, no, it's got to go out on Wednesday night. Can you do it? I said, I'll give you 15 minutes and then I'll come back. So I went into my office and I rolled myself a cigarette, smoked it and um, walked back out. And they said, yeah, we think so. And I said, right, go for it. And the next morning I walked over to the squadron leader and said, yeah, I think we can do it. But don't go daft if we miss the time. Mm. I said, we will try. Um, and the buggers got it out on time. Nice. They worked bloody hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that was a special forces one, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, so helping out there, I suppose. Pr yeah, basically. Bit, 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 pro bit priory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was needed. <laughs> needed, great. Um, so where did you go after your time there? Well, April 2000, no, 2000, yeah, April 2000, I was 55. So uh, you're, at, you're at Lynham? I'm at Lynham. 55, chief technician. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was get, doing the DMOB courses. Okay, you know, so you're looking at getting out. Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, because I can't go on fast 55. Okay. So I went to Chippenham College and I did a um, technical authors course. Um, I applied a number of um, things and I got taken in by Westlands. Um, and I explained this to, uh, I said to Westland, I can't start till April. I said, because I'm not due DMOB till April. The warrant officer got heard of it. He went to the squadron leader. He said, can we can we um, fiddle this? And the squadron leader said, yeah, I don't see any reason why not. Can Cy handle it? Because I'd already thrown a chief off my team. He was coming in late. And I went to Jim and I said, I can't have this. This chief is coming in late. I said, he went to sleep yesterday afternoon from dinner. I said, and three times I've told him that if he comes in late again, I'm not having it. Now I'm not. He said, you can't throw him off, Dinger. I said, yeah, I can. I said, because I tell you what, and this is going to upset you as well as it's going to upset me. If he isn't off my team tomorrow, I'm not coming into work. I said, he can sort it out. I said, I'm not doing it. And he said, then you'll be posted AWAR. I said, that's not my problem. My problem is this chief is supposed to be an example to the bloody troops. I said, and he's coming in late half eight, nine o'clock. I said, it's not on. And he said, well, you'll be on your own. I said, that doesn't bother me. I said, they know what they've got to do. They don't need me anymore. And he said, okay, I'll get it. Um, so basically, 
Um, poor bugger got thrown off my team. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's difficult when they are equal rank and you are um, really kicking somebody in the ass to. Uh... But yeah. Anyway, uh, going back to the warrant officer, he turned around to squadron. He said, "Yeah." So he called me into his office, the squadron leader, and he said. Um, when do you want to start on this job? And I said, well, I've told him I can't start till April. I said, because that's when my D mob. He said, suppose you start next week. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, if I sign an extended leave form. Okay, yeah. That allows you then to go and work for Westland, you get your feet under the table before April and you're laughing, aren't you? So I said, yeah. So I started with Westlands in January. Okay. I'll be getting RAF pay. I was getting Westland's pay. I was a very rich man at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so d d during that time when you're, like you say, you come to the end, 55, uh, can't stay on, what's your mindset after 37 years in the military? Are you, are you, are you looking forward to becoming a civvy? Or no. You, no. No? Are you, are you worried? Like Terrified. Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah, can you explain what, what your mindset well, was there? It actually didn't hit me until I came out. Um, but the first thing... It brought tears to my eyes. I mean, that may sound funny, but after 37 years, I went up to hand my 1250 in, which I happen to think is an, uh, an abominable thing to do. No, I think is that they, the ID card? Yeah, the ID yeah. card. I think they ought to either impress it with bet, as the Yanks do, you know, emboss it by putting it in a machine, stamp down, so that the word vet sort of stands out. Yeah. It's the same ID card you've had for, <clears throat> for me, 37 years, but it shows you're a vet and it should give you, in my opinion, certain advantages in Civvy Street, mm. e.g. two-thirds of rail fare or whatever. Anyway, they don't do it and this bastard of about 24, 25 years of age in front of me cut the damn thing into about six pieces. And I looked at him, I said, you really don't know what you've just done, do you? And he said, no. And I said, no, you have no idea what you've just done. You've just cut my heart. Mm. When I actually came out, my daughters, both of them, turned around and said, you've lost weight and you've lost colour. That's how terrified I was. Okay. Yeah. I was really scared stiff of coming out where, not just because I had the rank, because... I didn't use my rank very often. It was there, but it really wasn't used that often. Um, but purely and simply because I was leaving what I knew to be a family that I knew, trusted, and had grown up with from 16 and a half all the way through now till 55. Yeah. Yes, I was scared. Yeah. And did you have a mindset of what area you wanted to... Move to you. I mean, you, yeah, you I went, wanted to come down to the West Country. You wanted to come down to West Country and, and continue working on helicopters, or not necessarily. No, I no. no um, I purely and simply Westlands is not a mechanical team. I wanted to go into tech authoring, so I applied to various places. Um, I don't know what you call them, but th there's a firm that does interviews for Westlands. I didn't right. know this at the time. Um, and I went to this interview and they gave me a some stupid test. Bloody mad thing. Um, which is supposed to tell you what sort of personality you have. I could have told them that. <laughs> Bombastic, bloody minded, opinionated. <laughs> that's, uh, that's all me. <laughs> I got no qualms about that at all. But um, they turned around and said, yeah, we can offer you a job in Westlands. Where can you start? And I said, not until April. I mean, you know the rest yeah, of the story. Yeah, and then the rest of that. Okay. But you had an idea of which, which area you'd like to go into. Yes, because so that, I mean, I'd done the course at Chippenham College yeah. on technical authoring. Yes, I wanted to go okay. into technical authoring. Okay. After a year, I left Westlands. Right. Because their personal point of view, they governed by bullying, or at least they did at the time. I don't know who, how they do it at the moment because the Italians are in charge now. Um, but Westlands governed by bullying. Um, and I didn't like that. I don't like bullying at any time. Um, so I applied for a job in the MOD. Okay. Working at Yeovilton. Yeah. Okay. Uh, doing tech authoring on seeking. Uh, hmm. Basically, it wasn't tech authoring as such, but it was it was putting in modifications that had been drawn up, and you were rewriting books. That's all. But um, it wasn't a hard job, but it was. Um, it was interesting. It was good. The team I was working with were okay. So you're a civilian working for the MOD? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. That yeah. Sounds like a good, 
good feel. It was. Yeah. It was. I mean, um, yeah, there was another chief tech who was um, ex-REF. Um, he was working not not with me, but side by side. He was doing something different. Um, yeah, it wasn't a bad team. I met a very good friend. She lives in Yeovilton now, a girl called Ali. Um, and we've been friends ever since, and that was a long time ago. That was, what, in 2000? Yeah. So No, tw no. 2001 that was and we've been friends ever since um then they started to close that down and they wanted to go to middle wallop and they wanted my answer and i um i kept the answer going for as long as possible and the squad leader said in the fine we need to know whether you're going to middle wallop and i said no and he said why not and i said because have you tried traveling the 303 on a friday afternoon <laughs> it's I not said, good it, no <laughs> Everybody comes down to the West Country. It's murder. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, as you know, the 303 cuts into single lane at times. Not fun. No. Not no. fun. And Middle Wallop is virtually basic soap. So um, I didn't go, but I applied to go, still with the MOD, to um, Seeking IPT, um, which is where I met Manda for the first time. Um, and as she said, you know, she was married at the time, I was married at the time. Nothing untoward, it was just a couple of friends getting together. She then left the, uh, she left there, there, and then she travelled around France and kept in touch with newsletters. I didn't say very much to her, but I knew where she was and I knew what she was doing. And then we get back to um, me taking this guy, uh, then I retired. Uh, my wife had a stroke. Um, I carried on working for about another 18 months and then it got too difficult. Uh, Bill Mountain, my boss, um, turned around and said, um, are you all right? And I went, no, I want to change my hours. And he said, to what? And I said, half six to half three. I said, same hours, but slotted. I said, because I'm getting up at half five, walking the dogs. I was coming home, I'm having to cook dinner and walk the dogs and put my wife to bed. And he said, yeah, no problem. Um, so I worked the last of my time sort of doing half six till half three. Mm. Um, she died in 2012. Um, I was on my own for a couple of years. Um, what happened then? Oh, yeah, this mate of mine who I joined up with um, had multiple cirrhosis. He'd been given a terminal, he said, um, I think it was two or three months. Anyway, he said, but I want to go out on the piss one last time and you're single, and will you come up and help me? And I said, yeah. Well, it was a shambles from start to finish. I got up there Friday night. We were out on the piss on Friday night. We were out again on Saturday. By this time, I'm pushing him around in a wheelchair because he, he can't walk. But he thoroughly enjoyed himself, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Uh, broke a few ankles with the wheelchair as we're going into a bar, <laughs> and, you know, people going, ouch, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um. But there was no way I was going to make it all the way home. Manda had a boat in Lincoln. So I just rang her up and said, look, I ain't going to make this, uh, but I can think, get to you. Can you put me up for the night? And she said, yeah. And the rest, as you know, we spent on a two-hour trip. It took us six days because the engine kept cocking out. We got together very, very closely and bought a narrow boat. Did three years on the narrow boat, or the narrow canals of Britain, uh, England, going all over England. Chester, Ripon, uh, got nearly as far as Bristol, only the River Avon was flooded. Um, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, came back, went to Gretna Green, got married, and that's the end of the story, really. <laughs> the rest is history. The rest is history, <laughs> and still being made. Fantastic, fantastic. So it sounds like a nice roundup after retirement. Um, but I just want to ask the transition from military life you said you struggled for a period of time do you think going to then work as a civilian for the mod helped do you think that helped you yes it did yeah. um as i say westlands for a year um they ruled by bullying it was not a good situation and i didn't like it so i tried to get out as soon as possible the the first opportunity was uh working as tech author at um little yeovilton yeah um, the majority of people at Westlands were uh, ex-Royal Navy 
There was one other, R no, two other RAF guys. Um, between the servicemen, it was quite fun. Um, but it was still Civvy Street. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it it's, a, it's an entirely different set of rules. It, it's... Um, how do you... In the forces, and you know, being ex forces, you know you can get away with certain things. You know, um, you know you can say things to people, and they won't take umbrage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In Civvy Street, even with people who have been in the Navy for a length of time and have been in Civvy Street 10, 15 years, you you are on thin ice. You know, mm. you, you've got to tread careful because the moment you say something, um, people people tend to get uptight. Um, one example of that is an ex-corporal, little fat man, but an ex-corporal when the Twin Towers were hit. Apparently, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently he had friends out in America, not in the Twin Towers, but out in America. He didn't know where they were. but um, And I said, oh, I'm going out for a smoke. Welcome to the real world, America. Work this one out. And I walked out. I mean, I still think the same. I think Twi Twin Towers did an awful lot of good for America. Uh, killed an awful lot of people, but it's welcome to the real world. You know now what terrorism is about. Because up till then, they'd never had any other than Pearl Harbor, but uh, that's by the by. Um, but he got very, very upset. And he tried to explain to me. And I said, no, sorry, I ain't gonna go uh, doesn't wash with me. Doesn't wash with me at all. You've got friends out there. I haven't. Mm. I dislike America and Americans as a whole, not as individuals, because I had to go to Milton Hall um, for a um, Hercules um, thing. Doesn't matter what. Yeah, that was when I was at MTTH um, uh, about leaking Herc. And I went to Milton Hall because they run Herc's out of Milton Hall. And I was fated and wined and dined. It was a bloody great experience. And they were all Americans and I liked every single one I met. So it isn't the individual. Yeah. It's... The country as a whole, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why Amanda went to America on her own. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> she reckons I wouldn't have got out of the airport. I'm I'm of that help too. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But the good thing is you had that all that time uh, as a civilian working for the MOG. Oh, certainly. So, that's, so that could be It was could a lot easier. For, for yeah, much, much yeah, easier. Yeah, yeah, that's fair, that's fair. Well, Dinger, this pretty much brings us up to date, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Pretty good. Um, but this is a good time of the podcast uh, where you can give some advice for people out there. Uh, so we've got two little areas to look at. Uh, the first bit is for people that are thinking of joining the military. Obviously, you joined in the 60s a little while ago, but still there's going to be stuff that resonates uh, even today. So any advice you can give those people that are thinking of joining the military? Don't. Don't. Seriously. Okay, go on. Uh, RAF wise they have bucketed it around to an extent uh, there's nowhere to go you might get the odd trip to Germany or Cyprus um, but seriously the ground crew wise I mean I'm not going to talk about the flying wise uh, except that if you go in as a flyer take transport or helicopters because that's fun flying fighters might seem like fun but you're up there for an hour, somebody is whispering in your ear the whole time, and then you come down. But with Hercules or with transport aircraft and helicopters, you're flying by the seat of your ass using maps. You're going abroad because we've still got an awful lot of army bases and army people abroad that need supplying, resupplying. Um, Cyprus is one. Um, so, yeah, as, as ground crew, I wouldn't advise anybody to join. Okay, okay. But other sectors within the military, potentially, would you advise that? You're talking now about the other services? Yeah, other services. I don't think I'm qualified to talk about the army hmm. um, at all. Um, it depends on what your demeanour is, really. The army gets kicked around. Yeah. I mean, Senilaga, I mean, the things, the stories I've heard about Senilaga, um, you know, where it doesn't stop raining, where... You're made to dig in, and just as you breach the bottom of your pit, somebody says, we're moving. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're wet, you're cold, somebody's screaming at you at some time. I'm not qualified to talk about the army no. at all. So basically you've got to have a mindset to join the army. If you if you are prepared to put up with a total amount of bullshit, 
then yeah, the army's for you. Go yeah, for it. Yeah, the navy's pretty busy these days as well. So the navy's maybe. pretty busy, but at least mm. it's um, a chain of command that is straight up and down. You know your job. It is a job. Whether you be cook, whether you be engine room, whether you be electrician, or radar, or whatever, you know your job. You know exactly what you've got to do. Yeah. There's no digging in. I mean, somebody turned around me. Um, it's on Facebook, actually, an awful lot where, you know, of the RAF going to hotels and all the rest of it. The answer is, yeah, there's three things here. The Army, the officers stay behind. They send their men in to fight. The Navy, the officers and the men go in to fight. In the RAF, we go to bed. We send the officers in to fight. It seemed reasonable to me. <laughs> it seemed perfectly reasonable to me. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Well. The other part was, what, joining Civvy Street? Um I mean, that was advice really Prepare for people yourself. thinking. Yeah. But so, the, yeah, the other advice for veterans, so the ones that are transitioning from military to civilian yeah, prepare life. Prepare yeah. yourself. Okay. In what way? What can you share? Well, um, basically, if you can get a course that's going to help you outside, you know where you want to go, then take it. Get all the courses you can under your belt. The Army pays for it. The Navy pays for it. The RAF pays for it. it comes off your back. Not at all. You get time off work to find out where you can. Go for it. Colleges, anything you like. Okay. If you want to go into a farm, go to a farm in college. Yeah. So get that education behind you in that sector. Prepare. Yeah, prepare. Nice. Good advice. That's good advice, that is. That's good advice. Fantastic. Well, how was it for you to come on the show? Um, now we've, we've pretty much come Fairly to easy. Fairly easy. I've messed, the, I've missed an awful lot. Yeah. But then... You'd be here till seven or eight o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to fit in a 37 it is. year career. It is. <laughs> um, but uh, was there anything we didn't get to cover uh, that you did want to share? Uh, no, from your not, time at all. We covered not at all. Not at all. Except um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself from start to finish. I mean, including uh, the, the shouting and the yelling at Holton, uh, because you're nothing at Holton. Everybody is outranks you. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, it's really a question of um, make sure you know what you want to do. I loved it. I didn't know what I was going into, but I loved it. I signed on from 12 to 55, turning around at 12 saying, if you don't sign me on to 55, I'm out at 12. 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, but they signed me on for uh, 55 and mm. I loved it. It's good. Almost all yeah. of it. Well, Thank you for sharing everything that you've gone through because, yes, we've covered your 37 career in a, in a short space of time, but everything you have shared is, sounds really good and interesting. So uh, I'm glad it's you enjoyed it. fun. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, and also thank you for your time. Thank you for giving up some of that for the show. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much for coming on and right. sharing what you did. It's a pleasure. And lastly, I say this to all my guests. Thank you for your service. Fine. <laughs> I know Brits uh, struggle with uh, answering that one, but... Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, they don't. Service. I was stopped on the canal twice by somebody turning around and saying thank you. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Manda's an artist and she poked, she painted on the front of the narrowboat a veteran's badge. Okay, okay. And that's when they were recognising uh, Yeah, you. they were recognising it oh, as a cool. vet. Very good. And they Very were good. saying, did you serve? And I said, yeah. And, and a couple of them, one was only a youngster, 18, 19 perhaps, mm. and he just shook my hand and said, thank you very much. That's good, that's good. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Dinger. Thank Cheers. you. This has been Military Veterans Podcast. Out.